Bochu's secretary, review, and thoughts. Before I start, yes, I realize I really should put this video out, I guess it's a month ago by now, on Valentine's Day, but by the time I realized that I could do that, you know, it, it was too late to get it out in time for Valentine's Day. And at that point, I basically decided I might as well just do it when it came up in the schedule anyway. And I hadn't thought about it at the time when, it, when I decided to just keep it in the schedule. But I am now putting it out very soon after National Women's Day. So, you know, that, that does kind of fit. I, I realize that not everybody agrees with me on this, but I do see this as a very positive story for women. Now, a couple of quick off-topic things. For any fellow fans of Marvel Comics, the YouTube can channel Geekvolution just put up a parody of No Scrubs called No Scrolls. It's really, really funny. Treat yourself to it. And if you haven't already watched the most recent episode episode, sorry, of Summer News, definitely make sure to do that. Now, I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly comparatively short, at least that's the idea. And if you want to see exactly how long the review is before you watch any further, you know, the time codes are in the description box. And yeah, so the, the review here at the start is not going to have any spoilers. And if, if I do decide I want to spoil something, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done spoiling. So when you see me lower my index finger, you can unmute if you wanted to avoid the spoilers. Now, I have watched this, let's see, I think it's four times by now. So, plot. Lee is a young woman who has just been released from a mental health care facility that she was sent to because she accidentally cut too deep one of the many times that she cut herself to cope with the pain of her father being physically abusive towards her mother. It was mistaken for an intentional suicide attempt. Now she wants a job and is hired as a secretary by a man who goes through secretaries so quickly and frequently that he has a light up sign outside his office that says secretary wanted, similar to how motels have a vacancy sign. And the man who hires her is Mr. Gray. And as they come to realize, they're, they're, you know, they might just be a good match because it comes very naturally to her to be submissive and it comes very naturally to him to be dominant. And the two begin falling in love. Now, if this is something you've never heard of, this is a sweet, quirky, at times black comedy drama romance from 2002 directed by Steven Scheinberg. And the basic concept is a romantic comedy romance story with a sadomasochistic couple. And obviously this is something that a number of people across the political aisle, but for different reasons, may object to. And it is definitely, it is not for everyone. Some people will find this very upsetting and offensive. And you're not really wrong for feeling that way. And I do want to briefly say, when, when we use the term black comedy, one of the main things that can refer to is gallows humor. It, you know, comedy that deals with the subject of death. That's not really what this is. I think I almost might say it's closer to blue comedy, but then I, I suppose overall. Black comedy is the, the appropriate term to use, but this is not a movie that has, like, a ton of jokes about death. It, it, the, those wouldn't fit into the, the movie as it is. But it is this, it, it depicts things that many people find to be kind of shocking, and it depicts them in a way that is at times amusing at times even outright funny. In, in these videos, I like to get into whether or not I think the, the, the concept of the, the movie or game or whatever has been done better before. 
I haven't seen a positive depiction of sadomasochism in any other mainstream movie. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I personally haven't seen it. You know, movies like The Night Porter and The Piano Teacher both have it as a negative. I'm not saying that's wrong. Those are great movies. And if you are looking for movies that have a very negative depiction of sadomasochism, yeah, they're, they're really, really great. Both of them. I wholeheartedly, 100% recommend them for that. But I'm really glad that we have a movie like this because, yeah, I think I'm just going to show my cards right. I don't think there's something wrong with BDSM. I'm not going to talk about how, you know, like, don't worry. I'm not going to get into my own sex, anything. I'm just talking about BDSM in general as a thing that couples do. I don't see anything wrong with that. And if you 100% disagree with me on that, I'm not sure you're going to like this video. If you want to hate watch it, I'm not going to tell you not to. But, yeah. And I, I will be saying, I will be explaining some of the reasons why I think it is potentially a positive. It's definitely not for everyone. And I, I don't think it's healthy for anyone to pressure someone else into it. If you're not into it, you're not into it. And, but, but yeah, you know, this movie is way closer to Pretty Woman than to those two. You know, it's, it's Pretty Woman with self-harm instead of prostitution and as, as with, with, the, with the BDSM as, you know, part of the, the thing that works for, for both of them, even though at first they wouldn't have guessed that it would, yeah. So yeah, I would definitely say this movie was well worth making. And let's see. I think I might be making some very direct references to Pretty Woman. Once again, if I spoil anything, I will warn verbally and hold up an index finger. The reason I warn verbally is because some people might just listen to my videos, not watch them, and I completely understand that. I, it's, you know, my videos are not very visual other than when I act something out, or the like, but, yeah. So, so if you are just listening, I, I do try to warn verbally, also, before I spoil. Now, so, so yeah, the BDSM, a controversial, controversial subject, there we go. Very frequently, at least before this movie, maybe it's better today, I don't know for sure, I don't watch all of them, but... When movies and TV shows had BDSM, it was depicted as something inherently wrong. It was a punchline. It was a way to show that a character was evil and dangerous. You know, most, most depictions I've seen of BDSM in, in movies and TV shows, consent is not respected. And that's, that's something that a lot of people don't realize about BDSM. In a healthy BDSM relationship, consent is respected. I personally really love that this movie is honest about the fact that BDSM is not inherently bad. It's only bad if practiced badly. Because of the increased need for consent, since some BDSM can be painful, painful in an undesirable way, and dangerous if consent is not respected, people who healthily practice BDSM actually communicate way more openly about sex and are much less likely to go too far for what one of the people you know are involved are one second I'm getting there for what the other person involved with it are okay with and this movie also accurately depicts aftercare which I'm I'm not entirely sure that I can think of a single other movie that I know of that actually depicts that. And this movie definitely has a sense of humor, but it doesn't make a joke out of couples practicing BDSM. And I really appreciate this movie not using male gaze. You know, this is not, it's not that only women can watch this movie. 
I personally think it's great. You know, but the it's not trying to just satisfy straight male viewers of it, you know, which again, a, a lot of movies that deal with unusual sex, they, you know, they're filmed in a way that where it's trying to appeal to, yeah, straight males. And for sure some people will take issue with the somewhat loose relationship the movie has with consent at times. And, and certainly some of the time it's more, it's, it's nonverbal cues, which, you know, some, some people feel uncomfortable with nonverbal consent. But given that the film is a romance, part of the idea is that it's a seduction. And if you're not into romance, this might really bother you, and I can completely understand that. It used to bother me, but this is not a documentary. It's not supposed to be a completely accurate representation of a healthy BDSM relationship. And it does say that it's perfectly fine for a couple to be into BDSM. And, and it, does, it does use the trope that those who are into sadomasochism are people who have abuse and self-harm, you know, in, in their past. And even, excuse me, e even until very recently, that basically that BDSM takes over for that. And that is a little bit, it's, it's not the healthiest way to look at it. And it's, yeah, I do agree that a BDSM relationship, as long as consent is respected, is healthier than self-harm. I personally think that the only way for sex to be wrong is if consent isn't given, and you can't consent if you're one or more of the following. Underage, drunk, disabled, or in an uneven power relationship. And part of why this movie works is, I hope that the following doesn't sound cynical or unsympathetic, but... Basically, Lee doesn't need the job. If you really badly want it out, it wouldn't really be a problem. Mr. Gray has secretaries quit on him all the time. Not one single solitary person anywhere in the world would say that there was something wrong with her for leaving the job. And nothing in the movie suggests that Mr. Gray ruins the reputations or job prospects of the secretaries who quit. You know, we, we actually do see some of the people who have been in relationship with him, you know, to, to talk about it, and they're maybe, they're frustrated that it didn't, didn't work out, but they don't say that Edward completely screwed them over. You know, for example, there's, there, there's a time when, in the movie, when it talks about, like, the... the I forget what it's called, severance pay or something, and he actually paid more than the the secretary was entitled to. You know, he he. So so yeah, it's it's, and the movie makes it clear that it is a mutual relationship. They are both good for each other. And there's there's not very. You know, at at times. Edward actually seems like he, you know, he feels like they're, they're doing something that he's not completely comfortable with. Now, the, the movie, in, in the movie, scenes of self-harm and scenes of BDSM are presented sufficiently different from each other that we never mistake the self-harm as being attractive or the BDSM as being just as bad as the self-harm. And I realize some people will yeah i'm moving on honestly me personally i love the love that lee and gray share it's so life-affirming to see them make each other smile i might make some joke references to 50 shades of gray i haven't read or watched those everything i know about them i base on reviews by people who have but yeah, there's some chance that this is where E.L. James got the idea to use the name Grey. And, you know, technically, yeah, this, this isn't a spoiler. Technically, their relationship 
isn't Boston secretary. There's, you know, but yeah, the fact that his last name is Gray. Yeah, there's there's some chance that it that it came from this movie. Thankfully, in this movie, this couple come across as much better for each other. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, as I've already sort of said, I will try not to overshare or TMI in this video. I'm not going to get into my own personal feelings on the matter. I will say this is a movie you can enjoy even if you're not into SM. I personally know someone who loves this movie, even though they think that SM is probably only right for a few people, if at all. And also, if you're having, you know, some, yeah, something that really should be said, this movie is not porn. It's not pornographic. It is erotic, but it is a movie with story. And, you know, th this is not like basic instinct. That is a movie that I, for what that movie is trying to be, it does a good job. It accomplishes what it means to be. But that movie is not a healthy depiction of s &M, and it's not trying to be. But that movie is basically, yeah, very, very male gazy. Excuse me. Now, the, yeah, so the story was written by Steven Scheinberg and Aaron Christopher Wilson. The screenplay was written by Aaron Christopher Wilson. And it is an adaptation of Mary Gateskill's short story. And I'm really not familiar with the other writings of these people, but they did a really great job here. And for for fans of the, the Mary Gateskill... Oh, yeah, yeah, I did, I did say it right. I think Gateskill, short story. Uh, I suppose... Yeah, I'm just... I'm very briefly... Okay, so spoilers for Mary Gateskill's short story, and spoilers for this movie. As far as I understand, the short story has a, a downer ending where the s and relationship doesn't work out, and this movie has a happy ending where it does work out. So, no more spoilers for the time being. Now, the... In, th this is the part of the of, of my notes where I tr tend to talk about like twists. This is not really a movie that is much about plot twists. The the you know the the story itself isn't going to hugely surprise you. Yeah, you know if if you if you really prefer movies that have plot twists, this isn't really one of those. You know, it, I, I don't think it would really work all that well. It is basically, I mean, at its core, it is exploring the relationship between Lee and Edward. And, yeah, like, like I said, you know, romance, romantic comedy, that kind of thing. So, you know, the, some people say that if you've seen one, you've seen them all, which isn't completely accurate, but... There is definitely a certain, yeah. Now, the, 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 there is some truth to that. Honestly, I I haven't seen the other, I, I, I don't remember offhand what else Steven Scheinberg has directed, but he does a really, really great job here. I would be... I would like to watch more of his work, and the, you know, Maggie Gyllenhaal and, sorry, blanking on his name, James Spader are both incredible, and I, yeah, I have liked their performances and everything I've seen them in, so. But yeah, it, the, the, I know some people would not say that the, the direction of this movie is focused yeah, I, 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 I disagree. It's, it's not... Some people say that the story moves too slowly. I guess I can see what they mean, but I just... I, I don't think... 
I think the movie just isn't what they thought it would be. S certainly, if, like, if, if you sit down and watch this and you basically expect, like, Basic Instinct, you're definitely not gonna... No, that's... that's and, and I'm not saying the people who don't like it or who call it slow did expect that, but I... There's, there's nothing I would really cut or even trim in this movie. But, let's see... Yeah, I... I haven't seen anything else Steven Scheinberg has directed, but the yeah, I I would I really hope that the director and yeah, the all three writers and the director make more movies like this one. Now, this has a very striking opening scene. It immediately catches your attention by showing something a lot of people consider very unusual. And then doing that thing where it skips back in time. It, it jumps back in time by six months. So we see how they got there. And it works incredibly well. Unlike in a lot of movies where that kind of thing is used to, because the audience is presumed to be too shallow to get into the beginning of the movie. If there isn't a promise of something bigger later in the movie, it can really be a storytelling crutch. Some of the more sensitive viewers might turn off the movie right after watching the opening, and honestly, there's some chance that the rest of the movie just would not be for them. And, yeah, some people won't like the kinky stuff, some people won't like that the film talks about self-harm. The very first line spoken will give you an excellent indication of if this movie goes too far from what you're comfortable with in a movie. Yeah, it, it is not a spoiler to say literally the very first thing that, the, that, that we hear talked about is the fact that she was in the institution. And I think... Mm, it's maybe a, a minute or two later that she talks about that she accidentally cut too deep, and that's why she went into the institution. And she mentions that she's been self-harming for, for years, you know, so r right there, you know, that, that is, if, if you, if that is too extreme for you, the, yeah, the movie tells you right up front, we are going to be talking about something that is, you know, that a lot of people are not okay with. Now, the ending is very fulfilling. I won't give away if it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but it definitely fits well with what came before, at least in my opinion, some others. Some found it to be a betrayal of what came before. I understand what they mean, I just disagree. So just be aware that that might be your reaction. And you're not, you're not wrong, if that's your reaction. And personally, I, once again, I've watched it four times. I never lose interest along the way. And the, the few people I've shown it to also didn't. But some, some people have, have reviewed it and said that they did lose interest. Now... I have not read the original short story, so I can't say how this fares as an adaptation. But you can really tell that the people making it don't think there's anything wrong with sadomasochism. The movie shows that the people attracted to it may sometimes feel bad about it, but that ultimately it's not a problem to be solved. It's just an aspect of them that they either indulge in or repress. And the movie doesn't the, the movie says that there's nothing wrong with indulging in it and in, in fact that repressing it can lead to pain and frustration excuse me now the let's see, right so on the characters some people say that the characters are weird, odd. To some people it goes so far that they can't get into the movie. I've known people much weirder and odder than the ones presented in this movie, but 
yeah, just know it is something that might bother you if that is the kind of thing that bothers you. Now, yeah, so Maggie Gyllenhaal stars as Lee Holloway, a submissive secretary, and her character could easily have been completely one note, but she does sometimes stand up for herself if she feels like other people aren't treating her the way she deserves to be, and she manages to feel like she's still the same character, even though early on she's very demure and it takes a lot for her to be willing to confront someone. And over the course of it, she really, she comes to be so much more confident. And it really is, you know, that, that is one of the things I, I forget. I think I read somewhere, but I, I don't remember if they had always intended to open the movie with a, a quick glimpse into what would happen later. But one of the reasons that it works so well, I, I could see how it might be like a, a um, what are they called again? A, an executive's note or something. But it, it worked really well because you see how confident she is, the way she carries herself. And then it goes back and you see how nervous she is. It's a, it's a huge contrast. And the, the movie really, like from, from right away, you want to see how did she go from there to there. You know, how did she become so much more confident? And I I think I've read that some people didn't feel that it was credible. I personally find that it's completely credible. It is basically, he's the first person to really pay close attention to her. Like most of the people that we see her engage with don't really like like they they mean well and they try to be nice to her but they basically they they most of the people we see her interact with other than gray are her family members her sister and her parents and you get a sense that they've basically always like there are, there are some things about her that you know she she can be a little awkward and quirky and shy and they basically just don't talk to her about it and it's it's not the kind of thing where they it's it's very clear that they think that's the best way to help her you know the that it would be too painful if they did talk to her directly about it and Edward notices, you know, he notices the little things that, you know, the, the, yeah, I guess a, as a brief example, she, she has a tendency to play with her hair with her finger and no one else has ever really noticed that about her or, or at least not directly indicated that they noticed. And he is bringing it up as a point of criticism, but she does feel seen. It, it you know, for, for, for once, someone pays close attention to her. And that's, that's one of the ways where this, this doesn't feel like it was just written by I mean, yeah, one of the three writers is male, and the director is male, but two of the writers are women. And it is this thing of, that's that's something, I've, I've known a lot of people who had, I've known a, lot, known a lot of straight men who had a hard time, you know, really fully grokking this, but one of the most, so if, if a woman... Yeah, see, I, I gotta be careful I don't say something that some people are going to find. For many women, they want to be seen, they want to be acknowledged. And if you, if you directly note something that's very, you know, that's, that's, that they do, that not everyone does, 
you know, even if it might, at yeah, see, that's the thing. A lot of women don't like being criticized, and that's 100%, you know, don't, don't criticize if it's not 100, like, if you, if you're an employer and they aren't quite living up to, you know, the, yeah, what, what their job calls for, be nice about it, but, yeah, you know, you can, you can say, you know, you, you need to do this and this, you know, that, that sort of thing, but, in the case of this movie, and in some cases in real life, a woman would rather be criticized for things about her that are unusual than for nobody to really notice, or, or nobody to really bring it up. And, yeah, that's the, the you know, that, yeah, a, a lot of men think that Yeah, let me let me briefly a lot of women like if you're willing to spend money for them not as a sort of it because it shows that you care about them. It shows that you're willing to you know and and obviously not everybody can afford to spend very much money on the person they're with, but it, it is, <sighs> there are a lot of men who think that women want the, to be approached by men the same way a lot of men want to be approached by women, and it's, it's true for some women, but just, if you're a straight dude listening to me right now, if you're not 100% sure that it's it's something she'll respond well to you know maybe maybe ask before you do it if it's something that she likes when men do but just yeah because a lot of straight men love the idea of a woman just like you know grabbing them and physically you know imme like immediately going towards sex and so a lot of men think that women want that from men as well and that's something that unfortunately leads to a lot of yeah don't don't do that unless you're 100 percent sure that it's something she's okay with and james spader plays e edward gray lee's employer and sexually dominant lover and yeah it, you know he can be very controlling but sometimes he all he does also really you know praise when she when she does something especially well but yeah he's con controlling and demanding and yeah the the domination n not everybody who's controlling and demanding are dominance but it's it's something that can come fairly easy to yeah and Jeremy Davies plays Peter, and he's basically the stable alternative to Grey. Both of them clearly do love her and appeal to her in different ways. Peter's almost like a puppy. He's kind of adorable. You just want to hug him, you know, cute, sweet. But he brings up marriage really early in the movie, and even says he wants to have kids. And he's, he's just, you know... A lot of people could like him, but not want to marry him. You know, the, the, yeah. And Leslie Ann Warren as Joan Holloway, Lee's mother. She has a hard time directly facing Lee's problems with self-harm and the fact that her husband is abusive to her, but she does want Lee to be happy and she tries to help her. Very frequently when she expresses joy at Lee's success, it's this kind of very exaggerated, like you feel like she's hiding a lot of pain behind her smile. It's not that the smile isn't genuine, but it's, it's, yeah. And Stephen McHattie, incredibly talented actor, as Burt Holloway, and he has problems with alcohol and becomes abusive and... 
yeah, sometimes very irresponsible. And let's... yeah, the acting is excellent, and there is great chemistry. The people playing couples are very convincing, both the unhealthy and the un <laughs> yeah, both the unhealthy and the healthy couples. And Gyllenhaal and Spader are especially compelling together. And some people will find that they don't want the two of them together, but I would say you definitely care one way or the other. I. I forget if I read someone saying that they didn't really care, but I feel like the, the movie tends to make you care. And I, I understand why some people feel that it, it yeah, that they, they don't want the two of them together. And yeah, so, you know, James Spader playing sexual deviance, that's kind of his thing, you know, but he is really good at it. And there is this... Excuse me, there is a, there, there are more layers to his character. It's not just that he's, yeah. And, and it actually, the, I, I saw someone else praise his performance because it comes through even though, like, Lee, we literally hear her thoughts sometimes. You know, there's narration and she says exactly what she's thinking. But with him, we don't hear his thoughts, and he's not that great at openly communicating. He's very restrained, and, and yet he manages to convey that there's more there, that he's not just someone who, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the dictionary definition of a dominant is that they take some pleasure in, you know, humiliating someone else. If that was all there was to him, it wouldn't be anywhere near as compelling as it is. And that's, again, you know, some of the... Yeah, some, some many depictions I've seen of BDSM has just been that dominants are basically cruel people who use BDSM as a way to, yeah, to, to be extremely cruel to other people, even, and, and in many of these movies, it's even when the, uh, the person they're doing it to is not at all interested in, in that sort of thing, and, yeah. I think a lot of people write BDSM if, from, from the perspective of someone who doesn't understand it at all. And then it just becomes, well, I mean, it's just, it's just typical cruelty in their head. And, yeah. If you don't understand it, don't write it. Just find something else to write. Write what you do know, you know. Now, there's, there's some really, the, the dialogue is great. There's some really quirky lines. And there's some really very intelligent lines. Like the, ah. See, it's hard to not give... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to give examples, but there, there are times where characters will express with, with just... with surgical precision, verbally, exactly what someone else is thinking or feeling, or why they do a thing that they do. Now... And yeah, so the characterization, you know, like, like many other really great movies and, and stories in general, we see several of the characters in some very distinct situations. You know, you see them sad, you see them happy, you see them surprised, and you, yeah, you see how they react in, in these circumstances, and it really helps to inform who they are. And, yeah, so I I don't know the DP from much else. Right, actually, yeah, the one thing that I am familiar with that the DP did, that the DP for this also did, is Nightmare on Elm Street for the Dream Master. But, yeah, he, he completely understands how to film it. And there is this great sense of just...
there are a couple of fantasy sequences where basically it's a character imagining something and the way that you know the the choice of lens and the angles exactly right for that kind of thing you can immediately tell this is what someone is imagining and you understand even if it doesn't appeal to you personally you understand why it appeals to some and and that's that's key to a movie like this you know this this is a movie that if if you are into bdsm and you are trying to convince a partner to try bdsm this might help and it's also something that people who don't know very much about bdsm can watch this and again you're not going to learn absolutely everything and you know but but this could be a way for them to start to realize that you know to, to start to get a better idea of what that kind of thing is like and again you know if if you don't know bdsm and you're like not sure if you know you're you're a little worried that it might be too extreme for you do not watch the night porter the piano teacher or basic instinct now the yeah so the the editor also 100% understood how to really make it work. The movie makes really excellent use of the different kinds of cuts, and there are montages that are very well done, effectively communicate what they mean to, and they tend to get the... Excuse me, again, in my personal experience, they get the emotional response that they're seeking. And, yeah, so there are no special effects, and there are almost no stunts and that is exactly right for this movie now the production design i'm going to directly yeah this is this is wikipedia's entry on it since i've if you haven't watched the movie yet don't read wikipedia because it spoils it but yeah from wikipedia a central component to the film the office spaces of Edward and Lee took form after two years of planning by Scheinberg and production designer Amy Danger, who had collaborated with Scheinberg on several projects. Their desire to have the office feel homemade and express Edward's interest in the growing of plants led Danger to juxtapose a natural decor in the office with a predominantly artificial outside world. Speaking of her choices, Danger compares the office with the rest of the film's locations. All the materials I used in the office were natural. Natural wood, bamboo, ironwork. If I wasn't using natural materials, it was natural colors, like in the botanical wallpaper. In contrast, everything in the larger world was fake. I covered Lee's house in plastic sheeting and used artificial manufactured colors. And it really has an effect. It really feels like the office is the place where both of them can be themselves they don't have to put on a facade for other people it's not something to tolerate it's it's wonderful it's exactly what they want and yeah that if if that aspect of the movie didn't work the movie would be a lot lesser for a, a lot worse off and it, it yeah the the moment that you see, you can immediately tell this is so I mean the the very first time that you start to see it you you don't quite know what to make of it but very soon after you you know it really communicates that this is the place this yeah this is this is a place where you can be who you are naturally and yeah so on locations and yeah, so this is, again, this is directly from Wikipedia. Although the interior sets were carefully constructed, the filmmakers did face some location-related challenges. Notably, in one instance, the filmmakers accidentally obtained shooting rights for the wrong park. Gyllenhaal encouraged them to hastily shoot the required park scene anyway, without permission, while crew members distracted the local police. And, yeah, it... it
Yeah. As a general rule, don't don't break the law unless you absolutely have to, but that is kind of kind of fun and also really yeah, like it's it's yeah, I th I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Now the movie is very easy to follow. It's meant to be, and I agree with the decision. Now, so the yeah, so the the uh, what's it called? Composer for the movie, Angelo Baralamenti, also scored Mulholland Drive, The Beach, Arlington Road, and Lost Highway, and the excellent job on this and really great choices of some of the original songs that are wait yeah yeah songs that they use that wasn't specifically composed for this and yeah it they they have a really great effect so yeah the the comedy blue comedy dark comedy sharp comedy and we laugh with the characters not at them and yeah, so um, some of the, I guess, yeah, I think that, yeah, some of the, the violent scenes are meant to be upsetting, getting across abuse and self-harm and such. And yeah and and other times the you know some of the bts bdsm there there is some yeah, see, I, I don't know that i would use the word violence i if it if physical abuse ah yeah see let me think it could read as physical abuse but uh, yeah and And yeah, again, you know, the movie never accidentally mixes up self-harm and BDSM. Or, or physical abuse, actual physical abuse. And yeah. And it is... It is a largely realistic movie. The, the one major thing is the idea that something quite this sexual would be going on between, you know, a... Uh, some, someone working in an office and their secretary you know it's it's kind of the it's it's something some people imagine but it's not something that actually happens the way that the movie depicts it you know and, and again it's not it's not really meant to it's not a excuse me and yeah so the pacing it's not very fast, but it's not slow. There's always character development, character growth, new things established. Some people feel that it's too slow, and I mean, the only thing I can say is they must not get that much, you know, of a positive... They must, yeah, S seeing Lee and Edward together you know, just, yeah, must not make them happy. And that's not, that's, you know, it's not for everyone. But, yeah, to, to me, if, if the movie was even longer, I would still love it. It's, uh, yeah. Now, it is an hour and 46 and a half minutes long. And it's, it's worth the investment of time if you... It's it's one of those things, if you're not interested in, if, you know, if maybe around the 30 minute mark, if you're not interested by then, I'm not sure the movie's really, you know, it's it's not your kind of thing. It's just not the, the, ah, what's the word? I'm, I'm not sure the movie is really going to convince you otherwise. And...
it's fairly unique. And yeah, so the the sexual stuff, you know, the, the, it has the potential to offend both conservatives and progressives. You know, so, some people will read this movie as a sort of anti-feminist, women like to be manhandled kind of thing, and I really don't think that's... Again, I've watched it four times now. I really don't get the sense that that is... You know, again, Basic Instinct is a movie where, you know, that that's telling you that some women love this kind of thing, you know, and if you manage to hook up with, you know, women like that, you're really lucky and that's going to be awesome for you. But this movie is saying this works for some people. You know, it's, it's the sort of thing, like, a lot of people aren't, aren't going to see that much of themselves in Lee or in Edward. And it's, yeah, I, I know, I know people that are similar to them in real life, and I know many who are nothing like them. I, I don't think that, no, the, the movie isn't saying that this is something everyone would enjoy, you know, it's just saying there are some people who do enjoy it, and when they meet someone else, who also enjoys it that can be really great for both people and yeah but yeah I would say the the best element of the movie is the positive depiction of a BDSM relationship and yeah so if I had to criticize you know, I, I do think the the trope of self-harm and BDSM being, you know, just like the basically the wrong way and the right way to handle pain and the, the thing with, you know, since it's a romance, there's a lot where we don't see consent. Yeah, but the... Yeah, again, it, it used to bother me about the movie, but when I recontextualized it as a romance, you know, that is, yeah, the, the, it, it does it, it, it does it exactly right for that genre, and if you're not, if you don't like romance, or you don't think it's right to do a romance that's about BDSM, yeah, the the movie is not for you, and nothing. I I don't think the there's really anything in the movie that would make you change your mind about that. And let's see. yeah, so the thing I was most looking forward to about the movie was a movie accepting BDSM as perfectly healthy, and the movie exceeded my expectations. And yeah, it's the the movie is both entertaining and actually good. And let's see. yeah, I recommend it to anyone who wants a movie that's very accepting of BDSM. Now, the the trailer gives a pretty good indication of what the of of part of what the movie is like. The poster and the DVD cover do not. They are ba basically, yeah. I'm, I'm the the. It's the image of a, a secretary, seen from behind, bent over, and that basically communicates that this movie is the the just of um cheesy sleazy kind of depiction of the the fantasy that some people have about you know the the 
the guy in charge at the office having sex with his secretary. And I'm not going to claim that I know exactly how, what, what it should have been, what the image should have been instead. But I definitely agree with those who say that it's, that's not the right. Yeah. Now, yeah, so this has 76% on the tomato meter for critics, 82% for users, excuse me, and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the Metacritic, yeah, on, on Metacritic, the critic rating is 63%, and the user is 7.7 .7 out of 10, and that does make a lot of sense. Depending on which critic you listen to, the movie is either too tame or too extreme. You literally cannot please everyone. That's, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, so, on IMDb, it has a 7.0 out of 10. And I think it should be higher, but it's not for everyone. And, yeah. So I give this eight unusual positions at work out of 10. And that was the entire review. So here we get into the spoilers. This is where the thoughts section starts with the section called disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth the time. So, I... From here on out, I'm not going to warn when I spoil this movie, but I will still warn if I spoil anything else. And as usual, hold up the index finger while I do it. Since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible I will touch my face. I think I already did. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again carefully before going out. And... Yeah, so, content warning and a trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, sad sadomasochism, including, at times, without clear de depiction of consent, and self-harm, including potentially suicide via self-harm. I mean, I guess, basically, when, when we see, like, there are a few times where Lee wasn't expecting it and at first wasn't okay with it like the 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 spanking scene but most of the times when we see the the depiction of the the BDSM you know based on her expression it looks like she is 100% on board with what she's doing and I understand if that is triggering for, for some people, the fact that we don't see clear communication about it. Now, let's see. I probably will swear in this video, but not more than, yeah, not, not a lot. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say this, and... Uh, in this is not out of bitterness. Also, not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting. Other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here: I loved every line they put in the IMDb memorable quote section. So you could just look that up instead. Just look that up, period. Instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. 
you know, they're sweet when they mean to be, they're funny when they mean to be, they're insightful when they mean to be. So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of this MSC Gray riff tracks and other jokes. There's there's not a lot of jokes in this one. It's mostly going to be commentary. Now, the, the very next section is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. And the final section, I get into stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Ron Swain's Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. Now, let's see. I would say the movie has empathy for all of its characters, and I think that was the, the right choice. You know, basically. There are a couple of them. You understand why Lee doesn't stay with any of the other BDSM people she tried to go out with. You can understand why, you know, she doesn't marry Peter. But you don't really get a sense that they're, like, bad people. Yeah, so I think the first time I watched this was around 2000, in, in 2009. It's possible that I watched it earlier. I, I think it was 2009, yeah. And my making jokes on this should not be taken as me thinking I'm joking about. It's actually bad or me wanting to make light of, a, of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to MST through gain overanalyze everything I watch and play. Now, let's see. Yeah, so that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Excuse me. I like that the, the opening credits are typed. So I already talked about, yeah, I guess I just just briefly, I haven't talked in detail about, but I, I really like that the opening, you know, it shows that, yeah, I, the, the, the very first, maybe two minutes, I think, of the movie, other than the credits, the, just seeing Lee, I, I don't remember what it's called, but the the bar you know on on her her neck and her that that her wrists are bound to you know you you see her in that and you you know you see her face she's she's into it and you see her carrying out her secretarial duties you know she doesn't even really appear to be having any trouble with it you know, and, and yeah, tells you right off the bat, they found a way to make it work. You know, it's not that they're not doing it instead of doing the, the actual work, their jobs. You know, I mean, they're poor clients if they don't do the work, but no, they're, they're doing the work. And, and the, uh, what's it called? And that, yeah, so yeah. They're, they're doing the BDSM, they found a, ma a way to make it work with also her doing her job. And, yeah, I already mentioned the, the confidence, and then when we see her, you know, afterwards, and she's, you know, she's walking out of the, the, ah, I forget what it's called, I'm going to go with institution. And, you know, she pulls up her socks, and there's just, you know, her body language, she's almost apologizing for existing, I, I, yeah, and it's just you, you you look forward to seeing her go through the transformation to be more confident. And the 
yeah, the the narration of where, where she talks about, you know, the, the fighting. I think it was that her dad was yelling at her mother and she felt the need to self-harm and she cut too deep because the, you know, she only had like a second or two while her mom's back was turned on her. And so she accidentally got, yeah, she, she had to hurry to be able to do it in that short amount of time. And because she was hurrying, she accidentally cut too deep. And just right off the bat, like, there are a lot of people who hear that and they're like, this is this is not a movie for me. And I, I think, it, I, I like that the movie just immediately tells you that. Because it is, you know, it's... I, it's almost like you you should that they should have put the opening scene on on YouTube so you could see that and if you're still there okay you can watch the rest of the movie but you know I I I don't think I've ever walked out of a, a movie theater before the movie was over but I can understand if someone would feel bad about that would would feel like they had to based on that but. Yeah, the movie tells you right off the bat it's not gonna it's not gonna ease its way into self harm, and it's not going to wait forever before it starts showing BDSM. And yeah, I I think it's good. I I think they would have had trouble covering as much ground if they were much slower in getting to that. But yeah, the the they you know Lee goes home. And just the, the look on Lee's face and her married sister and husband when they realize that the father is drinking immediately tells you this is a sore spot for the family. And one of the really heartbreaking things about Lee's self-harm is, you know, the, the moment that she's... The... the one second. I'm trying to decipher my notes here. Yeah, you know, she, she gets out the, the sewing sewing kit, I think it's, yeah. And we can see immediately that she's done this countless times before. She knows exactly how to do it. You know, she she gets out the, you know, she, she has each of the, the instruments have, have their own place in the, in the kit and you know, one of one of them is she. She took this. Uh, what's it called? Like a ba ballet dancer doll and sharpened one of the, like I, I guess it's the the toes out at the end. And it's just this thing of like she didn't just like get a knife. It's like it's it's almost like she cuts with that thing because she feels that she's not living up to the feminine ideal that the ballet dancer represents. So, yeah. It, and the, the, you know, she gets out the iodine. Like, she knows 100% exactly how to do it so that it doesn't go completely wrong. And it's it's such a relief when she put it back. You know, the, the first time in the movie where she's, we see her get it out and she's about to, but she does put it back. And Lee looks at her parents fighting, and we see that her father is physically abusive and leads directly to Lee self-harming. I love seeing the smile on Lee's face as she's doing a good job at typing. I don't know why, but I like that we just briefly hear the, the thing that she's... You know, yeah, the, the thing that she is typing, and it is like this. It's a good example of, like... I, I can't, I don't have it verbatim, but I, th I think it's in the memorable quote section. And it is this, like, it's a collection of words that you have to master. If you if you can't do the, the ten finger typing, it's going to take you forever to get through. Uh, you know, it, like, uh, there are some people who type with only one finger, and for them it would take an eternity. They would not be able to do well at this sort of thing, and that kind of job would not be good for them, you know. But... Yeah, you know, she she sits there and does it very carefully, and and you you hear the the words, and it is this, like, it 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 makes sense, which really helps. I type a lot, or used to, I less now because of my wrist, but 
carpal tunnel, but the you know makes a it, if the thing you're typing makes sense, that's a huge that 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 makes it a lot easier than if you're just typing something that you you don't understand. It covers a lot of the different letters, and and it gets across the entire um, yeah you know and the the um, and some of the words are very long, so you have to focus on the one word before you press space and move on. It's like hypothetically, if they just had to type like you know short single syllable words, but like I think one of the words is flowerless or something like that, you know, it, if, if you've never typed and you just sit down and try to type a long word, you know, the, it, it takes a little more practice than, than short words. And we get the, yeah, we get the devastating details about the self-harm incident that put her in the institution. That, that's right, it doesn't, we don't get it right away, the, the yeah. And Lee tries to throw out her self-harm kit, but she can't quite go through with it. It's hard for me to overstate how happy it makes me to see Lee happy and smiling when she's practicing what she's going to say at the job interview. And the job interview itself is so awkward. And as others have pointed out, I, th I think somebody straight up used the, the term that the, the questions he asks her are illegal. And it is like, if you ever experience this in real life, don't. That's... Yeah, it's a it's a huge red flag, you know. But it's a romance. It's a romantic comedy, so it's a meet cute instead. It's a it's a fun first kind of, yeah, you know. You you may not like Edward from right away, but you definitely have an emo like you you're you're not like uh, boring. Let's get like you're either kind of fascinated by him or you think he is scum. You know, there really isn't a middle ground. And Edward puts away the red markers, and it's clear it's a dramatic thing for him. I, I saw at least one reviewer like say, "I never, I never felt so strongly about red markers before," or something. And it's, it's true; it, it really is like seeing him, like basically. I mean, the job interview, and he he gets rid of the the red markers. I mean, I guess he's basically saying, "I'm not, I'm not gonna do that again. It it keeps going wrong. I'm I'm done correcting mistakes." You know, because he only starts doing it after he sees that Lee went on a date with Peter. That he doesn't like. That makes him jealous. And then he starts doing that. And in general, criticizing her only happens after Peter. Yeah. Poor Lee struggling with the water cooler. And she feels bad about the idea of going and asking Edward to either do it or at the very least help her with it. She clearly she can barely do it by herself. I mean, ultimately we don't know we don't see her put put the water cooler on without help. It just cuts away. So there is a chance that she I think she eventually managed to Oh wait, yeah, yeah, because when she goes back in there and and she's she's got some water on her shirt. And he looks at her as she kind of, I think she like dries it off a little bit or something. And he seems surprised by that. So he must not have helped. I mean, I guess eventually she had spilled so much water that it wasn't too heavy enough to, for her to, but again, red flag. Do not, yeah. There's something about you. You're like a sphinx. I can't read you. And Edward talks to Lee about how closed off she is. And the bliss on Lee's face in the bathtub when realizing what to say on the phone just warms my heart. I, I, I love seeing them happy together. It's, yeah. And Edward's on the floor exercising. And the first thing that pops in my head, in the morning, I do the stomach crunches. I can do a thousand now. And Lee's mother shows up five hours before she gets off work and acknowledges, I know, I know you're not going to be off for another five hours. And she stays there. You know, she doesn't, she's not surprised and drives off. Just, yeah, she can't. When she's at home, 
Every so often, her father, her, sorry, her husband hits her. You know, he, he gets drunk, he hits her. It's, and it's not, she, she doesn't really have the strength to leave him. And, yeah, I mean, ultimately, they never even discuss, no one in the family directly talks about the possibility of, of, of the two leaving each other. Or, I guess, technically, one of, yeah, one of them leaving the other. It's, excuse me. There are no mutual dumpings. That's just something dumpers say to make themselves feel better. But that's the words of a typical dumpy, of course. And, and after we rummage around the trash, Edward just says, Oh, you didn't need to do that. I found another copy. And Lee sees that Edward threw away the donut she got for him. And Edward sees the, the cuts on Lee's... Ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know, he, he sees the little band-aids as she's doing the bending over that people think about when they think uh, you know, when they imagine secretaries and CEOs having affairs. I feel so bad for Lee as she struggles to deal with the telemarketer. She doesn't want to be rude, but obviously she, you know, she's going to have to get them back off the phone. You know, they need the phone to be free. It can't be, you know, and, and she's also the only per. you know, there's no one else there to help Trisha deal with, yeah. Look at Lee so confident in telling Trisha that Edward isn't there. And when she, you know, she, Trisha, Trisha realizes Edward is not going to come out and talk to her. So she puts his coat on the floor and stomps on it. And, and Trisha also very quickly, you know, she's barely met Lee before she, you know, she says submissive. You know, and... and we, we don't know exactly what did happen, but it seems like Trisha and Edward, I mean, we know that, uh, was it divorce papers? I forget. He, she says, tell him to sign the papers. I think it was divorce papers, she said. And the, the you know, she she's very clearly... You know, like he's he's legitimately kind of scared of her, or, or he, yeah, he gets anxious around her. So basically, I would say she's almost definitely dominant, and maybe for a while, the two of them thought that he could be the submissive in their relationship. But then, you know, after a while, they just they had to admit it's it's not working out. You know, and now she sees Lee there and she's like, so he found he found someone else to be the submissive so he can be the dominant. And she she does show up during the, the you know, hunger strike. And, you know, she, yeah, she, she says, the thing with the, the worm was brilliant. You know, so she, she. At first, she's like, Ugh, yeah, typical. But later on, she's like, you know what? That's, yeah, you, you two work well together. I mean, and it's again, like, you can see it from her perspective. Like, you know, there, there's, if, if he keeps refusing to sign the divorce papers, you know, for, for example, she can't get married, she can't get remarried before the divorce has been finalized. You know, basically, she wants him out of her life, and he refuses to just sign the papers, you know. But at the same time, the reason he's not is because she makes him really anxious. So, you know, considering how much, like, he, the, the, he, can, he can criticize Lee right to her face for, for you know, minutes on end. And, and talking about the, the tiniest little things about her, but he can't... You know, he, he can't even face Trisha. You know, he, he straight up tells Lee, I'm not here. So it is this, you know, the, the movie really understands that, you know, dominants are not dominant all the time. Submissives aren't submissive all the time. 
Lee's father calls and he's clearly drunk and he's you know he he doesn't even really know where he is or at least he doesn't tell her where he is and Lee is upset and so he's about to self-harm but Edward you know spots her and the the you know yeah so so she yeah yeah because because he spotted her she puts it away if I recall yeah but you know now we know she does bring it to work you know maybe at this point she can't even imagine leaving the house without it, at least not for several hours and Peter takes Lee on a date to a laundromat I I can imagine it's like maybe to save money or something but it really is not the kind of place where you take a date and Edward sees Lee on the date with Peter and clearly doesn't like it and Peter's already talking to Lee about having babies he you know, he means well, he is sweet, but he clearly doesn't know how to talk to women, you know, I mean, they they already know each other, you know, they, let's say they went to school together, I want to say, but it's not, you, you have to, you have to work your way to that, you can't just say it just like that, you know, and, and she does also like, whoa, that was, holy crap, that, you know, was not, excuse me, was not ready for that. Peter and Lee together are really adorable. You know, the, the, you know, she points out, a, what are they called, tidy, tidy whities or something, you know, the, yeah, the, the, yeah, I suppose, yeah, debating with myself whether or not I should make that joke reference, I don't, no, I'm probably not going to do it, but, yeah, you know, he, she, she mentions to him, well, if you wear tidy whities you know, that means you can't, you know, you, you have a lesser, you have a less of a chance of having babies or so, you know, and, and, you know, he's, he's, you know, he stretches some of them and throws some of them out and says, to babies, to diapers, and, you know, he does make her smile, you know, it's just, Basically, it's it's the the sexual element, you know. He, yeah, he's he's not capable of do, or willing, maybe, of of doing what she wants sexually, and that that is a like. It's it's difficult to make a relationship work if there's no sex. And I. I I heard somewhere that if the sex, if, if, yeah, if a couple, if, if their sex is, if, if the sex is good, then it's 5% of the relationship. But if they have trouble with sex, then it's 95% of the relationship. And yeah, you know, I, I really appreciate that the movie does not make Peter out to be like, you know, that's, that's the thing with, like, romantic comedies, and a number of them, they, they do just make, like, one of the potential partners out to be just completely obnoxious, and that's not really the case here. It is based, you know, of course, it's, you do also, Peter's the other kind of potential partner. He's the you know he's he's sweet, but they doesn't quite work together. They're not quite right together, and you know when when I watch movies like this, I always feel bad for that character. But you know, hypothetically off screen, maybe they do find someone they can be with. You know when when they're such a sweet and giving person, you know they probably will be able to find someone. But yeah, I really appreciate you no. Know, they're they're not made out to be obnoxious. I I really can't stand that in romantic comedies when yeah. Especially when it's the thing of like you know, the, the male lead is in love with the girl and she already has a man, but he's a real jerk. So, you know, he just 
once once they break up, then the guy can be with you know that's that's not a healthy way to approach relationships. But yeah, Edward gets into the car after seeing the date and gets out a red pen. And the very next day, he's marking her typos in red and really harsh with her. I'm really glad that in later scenes, she likes it or it would be really upsetting to watch. And Edward goes over all the little habits of Lee. And Lee... Yeah, Lee has dinner with Peter and his parents, and the parents are pushing really hard for marriage. And Lee did try to, you know, she, I, I, I don't know what it's called, but she, you know, he told her that she plays with her hair, and now she's wearing, like, yeah, I, I don't know what they're called. The, the, but, but she's wearing those in her hair, and I, I don't know what the, the, thing is called either but you know he said that she sniffles and so she got this little bottle thing that she you know that that means that if she does that every so often then she won't have sniffles and I really love seeing Lee smile when Edward claps at her getting a bigger voice out of her tiny little throat for the phone and and it's I don't know it's just like you know he he brings her in there and and he says the phone is ringing and she's like the phone isn't ringing what is he talking about and then he starts going bring bring and and she's oh he means oh right I get it now and she does it and and she talks really loudly and and he's like it's just. And, and she smiles, and it's just, it's so nice. Just the, the, yeah. Sue me. I like it when characters in movies make each other smile. I know some people really hate that about some of my videos, and I'm really glad to be able to just not care about them. Although I, get, I realize that some people think that me talking about it means that it's still something that bothers me. But if it bothered me, I wouldn't still be doing it. And Edward asks questions, really personal ones, and Lee doesn't quite know how to react. And Edward tells Lee she can discuss her problems with him, and they talk about the self-harm. And, and his lines, like, he clearly 100% understands it. You know, it's it's... Just, it's such an excellent way to, yeah. And Lee tells her mother she's going to walk home from now on, and she she's really glad to be walking home. And... And she tells her mom the, the lock can come off the cabinet and she throws the sewing kit away. And the metaphor is quite clear. She's, you know, she's standing on a bridge and she throws it into the water. You know, it's not by accident that she doesn't just throw it in the trash. It literally is water under the bridge. It's behind her. She's a different person now. It's forgotten. It's in the past. I love the montage of the role playing in the office. Just, you know, re really gives you a sense of what their relationship is like. And you see Lee smoking and reading Cosmo. You know, it's like she's she's coming into her own. She's becoming an adult. Now, you know, smoking. I don't like telling people not to smoke. I just think you shouldn't smoke around people who don't, you know, yeah. Smoking is not a sign of being an adult. Unfortunately, some ch teenagers, even children, do it as well. But it is movie shorthand for, you know, doing, doing something more 
kind of ris risque. And she has a red marker right by her, and she tries to imagine sex with Peter, but she just isn't attracted to him in that way. And she, you know, she puts down the the ah, the photograph of him, and then she, you know, it works a lot better when she imagines sex with Edward. And Lee is about to use whiteout on one of her typos, but instead she gives Edward the letter, and it's so disappointing when he just signed it. You know, he didn't. And, and it, yeah, he didn't look for typos or anything. She wants to play, but he has to work. And she even tries seductively licking the, the envelope before she closes it. And he's like, you know, he, I have to work. And she just, yeah, she looks so, <laughs> yeah. And... Lee's father checked himself into the hospital, which is clearly upsetting for her, her sister, and her mother. And Lee goes to Edward's house, and she doesn't quite know how to ask for his help. You know, for, for him to comfort her, make her feel safe again. So, you know, she makes up what she was going to say and leaves, and we can tell, you know, she... Yeah, she wishes she could have asked for his help, and we can tell he also knows that there's there's something going on, but he's also not a great communicator. And we get another montage, as we see Lee can't get Edward to treat her like more than just a secretary, and she puts roses in a lingerie photo on Edward's desk, making completely clear that she wants them to go back to the way things were. You know, she, she wants him to see her in a sexual way instead of just business. And now that he won't spank her, she tries to do, this, do it herself. It's just not the same. And Lee and Peter try to have sex, but he can't do what she wants sexually. And he's like, I didn't hurt, hurt you, did I? And her no. Like, the disappointment in her tone is palpable. It appears that the worm did the trick. Edward brings back one of his red markers. In fact, you might almost say that the worm has turned and is packing an Uzi. And Lee's so disappointed after Edward only masturbates, so she masturbates in the bathroom. And Edward initiates role-playing as if it's the first time they met and Lee goes along with it. But then he tries to end things and she doesn't want it to. And the breakup is really sad. And the other BDSM partners Lee tries to be with are, they're not made out to be bad people. They're just not a good fit with her. The movie doesn't really treat it as anything other than regular dating. And Lee goes to the office and tells Edward she wants to be with him. So he tests her, telling her to sit at the desk until he returns. And since Edward told her to keep her palms on the desk until he returned, she tries to answer the phone by picking it up with her mouth. Excuse me. And Lee's mother brings peas. I, I like how that almost becomes like a thing. Like, on the phone, she tells Edward what she's having for dinner, and he tells her exact the exact amounts she should eat. And the others are like sitting there, like they're basically shocked as she, you know, four peas, and uh, you know, and and when they're, there's also a, a scene where it might be like a montage clip, but you know, she's eating like also four peas or something in like a, a restaurant or something, and then yeah, when when she's sitting there for the the hunger strike, Lee's mother brings her peas and. You know, maybe that's a happy medium. We can we can agree. Then you're gonna eat something if it's something that he's okay with you eating. Please, you know. We see all the different people who visit and talk to Lee, and some of them approve, some of them disapprove. They're all trying to help in their own way. I I I quite like the you know there's a there's a priest who comes in and says. This is a very proud tradition. Monks used to wear thorny crowns, 
and nuns would sew thorns into their clothes, you know, and he's, so, so he's 100% on board, and that is, the, I mean, technically, there is a lot of that in, you know, the, the, yeah, and Edward shows up and walks past all the people and gives Lee something to drink. I'm not 100% certain what it is, but I think it's something with, with sugar, and I've, I want to say, like, maybe some, um, I don't think it's just soda. I think it might be maybe a milkshake or something. So, you know, sugar, and there's, it's, it's a little, there's a little bit more there, you know, it's because she's, she's had very little, you know, nutrition in, in the, I think we're told that it's three days, you know. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's something she can consume even though she's weakened and it's something that will help more than, again, water would not be that, you know, she, she needs something more. So, yeah. And Edward is so gentle with Lee, showing a lot of affection. And she puts a dead bug on the bed and waits with breathless anticipation him to get back to her and find it. Excellent fourth wall break here at the end with Lee looking directly into the camera, basically daring the audience to tell her that this isn't just as happy of an ending as the countless romantic comedies that are not about BDSM. I haven't really come right out and say it. I guess I'm going to now. I've watched a lot of romantic comedies. I know a lot of people think that they're not for guys. I don't really care. You know, I'm, I'm straight. I, I I think there's some really I'm I'm not uncritical of the subgenre, but I do think there's some you know, some some of it is basically just comfort food. I don't think there's something wrong with comfort food as long as you acknowledge that that's what you're you're doing. You know, it's don't don't go for comfort food if you need a real meal. But if you're just if you need comfort food, then go for comfort food and yeah, some some of them have a lot to offer. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, the movie is an hour and 42 and a half minutes long without end credits and 46 and a half long with them. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. Now, I am going to, let's see, yeah, so I think it's worth exploring whether or not the ending is a positive ending. The way I see it, it is positive. It's true that Lee isn't going to have a job from now on, and I don't want to be the straight white guy who says that what women really want and need to be fulfilled as a husband, but not a job, but... I'm not sure it was a job that she really wanted at the start of the movie. She just, she wanted something to change. She needed to get out of the house. Most, you know, yeah, the, the, she, she said that she got used to how it was at the, at the institution, but there's no, you know, she's not going to go back there. There's not really a future there. And she didn't, she didn't mean to go to the institution in the first place. She lived at home, and each time she saw her father physically abuse her mother, she would self-harm. And she needed to get away from that. And a job does get you out of the house for some hours, but so does moving in with your husband, you know. She, she took some pride in the typing, but I really don't get the sense from the movie that she cared that much about whether she had a job. She wanted to have something to look forward to. And she she especially got along well when the two of them were mutually engaging in the BDSM. 
I, I don't think that she's going to... Yeah, you know, it seems to me Lee finally feels accepted the way she really is, seen, you know, rather than people just pretending she doesn't have the problems that she does or hoping someone else will solve her problems. I read the ending as that she's going to spend a lot of time alone waiting for Edward to come home to her. I don't get the sense that that time is going to be filled with impatience and loneliness. I see that she's going to be giddy and excited for him to come home. The ending says that they're going to keep up the BDSM relationship. It's just as husband and wife instead of employer and employee from now on. And at the end of the day, that is... The, the thing with employer and employee is not really... It, it is better for them to be in a in a in a relationship where that is you know the the marriage when you marry someone you are basically even if you don't say the words you are promising you're going to take care of this other person and that's yeah she she wanted someone to to help with with the things that yeah she she used to be lonely and feel alone with her pain but now she's married and the BDSM takes care of the pain so let's see. yeah you know she's feeling loved and accepted and is basically self actualizing this was what she wanted more than anything i do understand those who criticize it for saying a woman even if only one individual one can only find happiness in being submissive to a man. That is, you know, if, if, that's, if that's something that bothers you, the movie doesn't really do anything to change your mind on that. But, again, the, the movie isn't saying... I feel like they, they basically felt like w one battle at a time, and I completely understand those who say... Well, we can't wait that long, but I think the idea, and, and you're not wrong, I think the idea was they felt that the only thing they could do in the, in the one movie was say that it's healthy for a man and a woman to have a BDSM relationship together, and getting married is kind of movie shorthand for happy ending, you know, so the, the, but, but yeah, you know, the, But yeah, you know, the, I already talked some about the trope expectation of the boss falling off the secretary. That relationship is thought of as inherently flirty. I don't agree that the ending betrays the character of Edward. The way I see it, he finally felt accepted to the point where he could be vulnerable. You know, that, that is basically like... Lee proves by the the you know what what they term a hunger strike but is really his test of her she proves that she's not going to leave him which is what he badly he he's so sure that the thing you know the the BDSM is something that makes him disgusting and means that you know he he feels bad he feels like he's doing something wrong to her even though she is okay with it. And, you know, she feels like finally here is someone who really understands her and who, yeah, he, he notices her. He, he sees the things she does. And let's see, there was one other thing that I wanted to say about that. You know, the, the kind of thing, you know, BDSM is the kind of thing where a lot of people don't accept the, the people who, you know, who practice it. And so it is the kind of thing where, excuse me, it is the kind of thing where 
people who like it can feel like nobody understands, nobody's willing to accept them. I, I do understand people who find it frustrating that the movie did. I think that it works. I think that, like I said, he, he was worried about if she would leave. But I understand people who say we have enough romantic comedies where there's a third act breakup. You know, I mean, ultimately, it's not actually, in a lot of those cases, it's about a miscommunication. But basically, you know, it's it's not, it's, it's basically that he, you know, he, he doesn't accept when she says that she does want to keep doing it. And, you know, by the end she does, you know, he accepts that she's proven it. I really appreciate that the movie shows that the sanatorium and the people working there are trying to help. Hollywood has entirely too many movies that say that people and places that supposedly offer help from offer help for mental health issues are actually horrible. There are some that are actually horrible, but there are many of them that are actually really trying to help and do help. I also really appreciate that this movie does show that if you are stuck in the same circumstances that lead you to engage in unhealthy behavior, then you might go right back to it. I suppose some may see the latter as disapproving the former, that if you ever relapse, it means that the mental health treatment for you that you got was not good. I, I disagree. I want to make clear I'm not saying there is in reality a connection between sexuality and self-harm, but it would appear that the movie says so, so I want to explore it. In the movie, the specific place that Lee cuts herself you know, c cuts herself, burns herself, is on her inner thighs. You know, it's it's something that a sexual partner would discover quickly, and in fact it is because of the skirt she wears that Grey is able to spot it. It's, you know, a part of the body that is usually re reserved for an intimate partner, so it, it is drawing that kind of... Uh, yeah, it, it is draw, drawing a... It's, just, ah. it's saying there's a connection. When you look at Lee's parents, you see that they're not really able to break out of the painful cycles that they're stuck in. We never find out exactly what drives her father to drink, but clearly there's some pain that he's trying to escape from, but it just makes him angry, and, take, and he takes that anger out on his wife. And, you know, Lee's mother feels like she can't leave him, and until... Lee and Gray start the their BDSM relationship, Lee herself seems unable to escape because her parents' pain causes her pain. You know, at, at one point we do, you know, I, th I think it's what they talk about when, you know, the, the same, yeah, let's see, it's when they, let's see, it's when they came back it's, sorry, it's when Lee came back from the, the sanatorium. I think it's that same day, or maybe the day after, that apparently he lost his job, and she's upset with him for having lost his job, and he claims that he's glad he lost the job because he hated the job. I do also really like that later in the movie, he does become sober, and yeah, at the very end, he seems much more... What's it called? More at, at peace. He's, you know, when he when he sits there and reads for her. I think from the Bible, but I'm not one hundred percent certain. You know, yeah, you you get the sense that, yeah, you know, this is not something that he would be doing if he was still, you know, get, getting really drunk. He's even though, you know, of course he's upset that she's doing this. But he's he's trying to, to help and he's not letting it he's he's not going back to drinking. 
now let's see yeah so the the trailer it's it's sweet it doesn't shy away from the subject matter it does underline that they love each other it shows a few of his dorky awkward moments as well and yes that that's the trailer that's two minutes and 19 seconds there i also found one on youtube that's a minute and 94 and it's basically the same but they cut off the last 30 seconds i, I don't know what exactly what that's about and yeah so the dvd comes with interviews let's see yeah and one one of the interviews is james spader and let's see, he said it was funny good-natured and thoughtful and one of the interviews is with maggie gyllenhaal she said unlike many scripts i read it's not offensive about young women it's provocative i was drawn to it she can't communicate with others. Most people don't even try to communicate openly and honestly with her, and she blames herself. Gray notices things about her that no one else has, so she likes it even though he's criticizing her for idiosyncrasies, which I find to be the most interesting in real-life partners. Perfect isn't interesting. Both characters are surprised they're matching each other. And... Let's see... Yeah, and so... There's also an interview with Steven Scheinberg himself. He had made a short film that got some attention. A lot of people that might agree to make the movie would actually say that the movie should end with her getting over the problem. And he balked, and then they left. He said, it's not like an alcoholic. It's not something that she has to recover from. Which is actually, that I don't recall if he said it in the, the interview itself, but the movie basically does show that, like, the, the pain starts with her parent with her father's alcoholism and over the course of the movie you know there are times where he has real trouble handling that and eventually he checks himself into a hospital and he then tries to become sober and it appears that it works and for the last chunk of the movie he is sober so the movie does say there are some things that you have to quit there are some things are not healthy for you. Alcoholism is not healthy. And there are some people who have a perfectly healthy relationship with drinking, but alcoholism itself is not healthy. And yeah, you know, the BDSM is not like alcoholism. So yeah, it's a movie that's supposed to communicate that S&M doesn't make you sick. It's not something that prevents you from having a loving relationship with your partner long term. She can't have a real conversation with her mother. Her father's inaccessible. When Grace spanks her, he breaks through to something inside of her. Maggie Jung Hall was the first to audition, and he and the cast and director felt she was exactly right. But he says they had to audition some others. They couldn't just give her the job on the spot, even though they wanted to. And James Spader actually had a problem with the director's... Oh, sorry. If James Spader actually had a problem with the director's direction... It was because there was an actual problem. It wasn't ego. And most of the time, James Spader didn't argue at all. And the DVD has a trailer. It's the same as online. And it has B-roll. And, yeah, you see them, some of them figuring out the exact detail of a scene where he, yeah, she brings him coffee after he yells, are you coming? Now, I... Yeah, that brings us to the final section. Critic sites, MBB, and Wikipedia. So, I forgot to write that. One second. There we go. Okay, so I have some notes that I'm going to... All at once, a post-feminist fairy tale about the flowering self-realization of a young woman, a parable of the ther therapeutic recovery, and an allegory of office politics. But ultimately, Lee seems far easier to tie up than to pin down. A feel-good movie about sadomasochism, the serial comic secretary, managed to be simultaneously subversive and sweet. In the wrong hands, the conceit could have turned ugly and offensive, 
that Spader and Gyllenhaal had a hushed, hilarious chemistry. This S&M satire teeters on the verge of sleaze and exploitation, but never descends into those domains due to Maggie Gyllenhaal's exquisite performance in a tricky role. Contradicts everything we've come to expect in movies nowadays, instead of simply handling the conventional material in a conventional way. Secretary takes the most unexpected material and handles it in the most unexpected way. If there's a joke here, it's on anybody who's too uptight to groove on the whatever gets you through the night love story. Secretary envisions. Even though Secretary goes down an uncomfortable road, it does so in a way that is refreshingly honest, intelligent, and eminently watchful. Secretary isn't a movie about humiliation or depravity at all. It's a dizzy fairy tale about two people who help each other to stop feeling ashamed of the very things that give them pleasure. I don't know about you, but I found all these outrageously romantic maneuvers both funny and endearing. One of the best of a growing strain of daring films that argue that any sexual relationship that doesn't hurt anyone works for its participants is a relationship that is worthy of our respect. If SM seems like a strange route to true love, maybe it is, but to this film's and its makers' credit, we believe sorry, it is to this film that we believe that that's exactly what these two people need to find each other and themselves. Oh sorry, I these are the rotten Tomatoes critics quotes. This is one of those movies that could have gone all wrong, but it hits all the right notes. For all the Dolores trim, Secretary is a genial romance that maintains a surprisingly buoyant tone throughout, notwithstanding some of the writer's sporadic dips into pop Freudianism. Secretary is one of the rare films that knows how to make fun of fetishes while having fun with them, and all the while taking them seriously as the people on screen surely do. Some people want the old ball and chain, and then so ball and chain. And then there are those who just want the ball and chain. If this is an accurate portrayal of BDSM, it seems like a bit of a bore, but I think that's the point. Offers something few films even attempt, an honest depiction of the role sex plays in everyday life, a source of empowerment and healing. Sadomasochism is treated as a joke in Secretary, but the fun of the movie is that it's also much more than a joke. Secretary is not a movie about fetishism, it's a movie about passion. Few films have ever captured the essence of a truly sadomasochistic relationship, as this and few actors could play the repressed, creepy, sensual weirdo better than Spader. The relationship between Quirky perfectionist lawyer E. Edward Gray, James Spader, and his obsessive secretary lead, Maggie Gyllenhaal, is uncomfortable and squirmish. Squeamish? Not, not to mention funny, upbeat, and oddly compelling. The movie enters a realm where few non porn, non -porn films venture and comes across as darkly funny, energetic, and surprisingly gentle. characters are more deeply thought through than in most right-thinking films that's the that there there is there is quotes about it in the writing hence air quotes
Right, and this is the Metacritic, ah, what's it called? Critic quotes. Secretary is one, uh, one of the best of a growing strain of daring films. Bless the lifestyle of Satin Rouge. It argues that any sexual relation. Oh, sorry, that was the same as still. Yeah. If it doesn't hurt anyone, it's deserves But in a very demanding, yeah, in a very demanding role, demanding a vast emotional range from cluelessness to confident role player and emotional adventurer, Gyllenhaal is outstanding. It's true. It's. She she gives an absolutely incredible performance. If if not for her, the movie would not work. If we didn't get Lee, love hurts in Secretary, but not too much. It's not impossible to imagine adventurous young couples seeing this movie and rushing home to try out the handcuffs and padlocks. Approaches the tricky subject of sadomasochism with a stealthy tread, avoiding the dangers of making either too offensive or too funny. Pulls off a neat trick. It's a poignant, sweet-natured love story in which what most of all most of us would call kinky sex, domination, submission, some enthusiastic spanking, is featured prominently but not prudently. Against all odds, director Steven Scheinberg has managed to craft an oddly compassionate and often very funny tale of an emotionally symbiotic affair. There's something appealing about an unapologetic love story set in an office that's only a few clicks off from looking like a fetish dungeon, and Spader and Gyllenhaal make sure that the romance kinks and all carries the day. Secretary, like the type of relationship your floors, is not for everybody, but it does what good films do best, that is, to provoke us, push our buttons, make us think, oh, and maybe even entertain us in the process. This is, yeah, I, I don't really agree with this critic quote, but I, I want to read it because it's, it's, it's well written, it's funny. Secretary is deeply conventional. Edward and Lee accept their bondage as the way to a more fulfilling life. It's the filmmakers who need to be spanked. Yeah, so some stuff on IMDb that I thought was worth bringing up. Yeah, I'm going to start with the, yeah, so there are two taglines. Assume the position and the story of a demanding boss and a woman who loves his demands. And, yeah, someone put on the IMDb quotes, uh, sorry, IMDb trivia section, and 190 out of 202 found this interesting. This is one of the only mainstream films that portray BDSM in a positive light and not as abuse. Despite her character struggling to lift heavy objects and climb into a dumpster, actress Maggie Gyllenhaal had no trouble performing these tasks. She does a really good job. It, it looks like she's she has a lot of trouble with the 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 water cooler thing. And under the IMDb Crazy Credits section, the legal disclaimer has typing errors. Fictitious, yeah, I, I'm just gonna, you know, fictitious, unintentional, and civil, yeah, civil liability is misspelled as civil liberty. And yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good, fun way to, you know, it's, it's like Lee typed out the, the, the legal disclaimer since he's a lawyer so she types out legal stuff and she mistyped so yeah that's that's really good I, I like when stuff like that can be worked into credits and let's see. yeah I'm just I'm very briefly going to I, I think this this is this is worth Repeating the this is this is how Edward describes the the self harm. Is it that sometimes the pain inside has to come to the surface when you see 
evidence of the pain inside, you finally know you're really here. Then, when you watch the wound heal, it's comforting, isn't it? It's it's spot on. That is that. Yeah, that's that's self harm. And and the. Yeah, the, the, um, I guess I'm just briefly going to say, yeah, so, so the, there's the quote from, it's right by the, the, it's, it's one of the last, you know, last spoken words. I, let's see. yeah, rather than read aloud, just, you know, I, I recommend it's, it's, you know, it's it's really well put. So it, if if you go to the memorable quote section, it's under Lee talks about what Mr. Talk, talks about Mr. Ray and how in love she is with him. Yeah, so this is from the IMDb Frequently Asked Questions. What's up with the worm? A worm is a dirty, inappropriate thing to find in a business letter, or any letter for that matter, and therefore deeply annoys Mr. Gray, who hates anything to be dirty or out of place. It's a mistake, which is why he circles it in red. Lee in intends it to get him upset so as to draw punishment, which of course it does. It has also been suggest suggested that a worm could be symbolic of a limp male member and could therefore be construed as an attack on his manhood. But if so, the end result would be the same, namely provoking him. And let's see. Yeah, and, and this is also quite good. The, oh, right, yes. Uh, some people have the, a copy that comes with commentary. I, I don't have that, so I can't comment on it. But yeah. Why does Lee stare into the camera at the end of the film? As Scheinberg says in the discommentary, it's the last confrontation of the movie, meaning she's stating to the audience that this is who she is, like it or not. Now, this is from Wikipedia. Many changes were made from Mary Gateskill's original short story, which was significantly expanded and giving greater depth to be named to a feature length film. I want to say, I really didn't feel like the movie was, it, it didn't feel bloated or there, there was no filler to bring it to full. Like, if I didn't know that it was based on a short story, I don't think I would have guessed it. Now, let's see. So, yeah, Lion's dialogue were changed. Lee's statement, I am so stupid, became the fantasy sequence cry, I'm your secretary, which was, which the director thought far more celebratory. Additionally, the ending of the story was changed to give it a more positive outcome to the relationship. Steven Scheinberg stated that he wished to show BDSM relationships can be normal and was inspired by the film My Beautiful Laundre, which he feels normalized gay relationships for audiences in the 1980s. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I copied in the top 100, the top 100 most useful loaded of the 424 IMDb user reviews, and let's see, I am going to find, so I'm skimming, I'm going to try not to leave too much dead air because that is of course frustrating for people watching. So I'm going to quickly see if I can find, let's see, let's... 
some people say that this movie is actually really, you know, like, oh, it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a good old fashioned romance. And then there are some people who read that and say, I, what are you smoking? So it's, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I, I want to just briefly read this. Someone commented earlier about whether this movie is sexist. I am rather critical of sexist themes and undertones, but at no point in this movie did I feel a twinge of sexism. Here, the leading lady does whatever she can to fulfill her sexual urges, often by herself, to the point of climax. How often do we see that in movies? Yeah, so like I said, I only read the top 100, the, the 100 most useful loaded IMDb user reviews. A lot of them are positive, but there are a few, you know, yeah, some, some people really don't like it. And those, you know, yeah, those were also voted on by a lot. Now, that brings me to the final section. Now, this is, a f yeah, when, if you go to a, to the IMDb page of a movie, there might be a section, d depending on how well known it is, there might be a section called ex external reviews. And if you go there, there are a bunch of links to other sites with reviews. And I... Let's see. Yeah, so there were 176 total for Secretary, and I copied in all that I could, which turned out to only be 64. The rest of them are dead links, languages I don't speak, that kind of thing. And I am going to go through the ones that I had to comment on. Lee is submissive, Spader is dominant and obsessive. He has a fetish for lining up red markers in his desk drawer. He demands perfection. She falls short of the mark, he punishes her, and this becomes a workable relationship. When he loses interest for a time and stops correcting her mistakes, she grows disconsolate. When he sharply calls her back into her into his office, she's delighted. well-judged account of sadomasochistic office romance that manages to be neither exploitative or prudish and has the wit to laugh at itself, thank God. Secretary, a small groundbreaking comedy, is a contemporary Cinderella story with a kink and a wink. Its endearing heroine is Lee Holloway, a repressed masochistically inclined young secretary who blossoms under the spanking hand of her boss. E.F. Gray, a grim, tight-lipped lawyer who presides over an office where the computer has yet to replace the trusty old typewriter. I can't help but notice that some some people who reviewed this seem to think that the the ah, what's the word they read the the movie as that it was an intentional suicide attempt. I guess they don't believe her when she says that she didn't mean to, she accidentally cut too deep. As far as I can tell, she, 
she had no intention of trying to commit suicide. She, she just, I, th I think the her exact words were that she slipped or something like that. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. Some people don't believe people when they, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess if I, I, I think that if Lee was suicidal, we would have heard it in the narration at some point. She, she basically doesn't keep anything from the audience. She, she never lies to the audience and she never really hides her most personal thoughts and feelings from the audience. So if she had actually been suicidal at any point in her life, I'm almost certain we would have been told, but it's, it's self-harm. It, it never goes into intentional suicide attempts, but yeah. Secretary is about as close as you can come to a movie with only two people in it without going all the way over to my dinner with Andre or Sleuth. Sleuth is amazing. Definitely watch Sleuth. There are other people, but who cares? Lee Holloway is the secretary in question, and E. Edward Gray is the lawyer she's a secretary for. And by the way, this is a movie about precision, and it is very precisely entitled Secretary. No, the. And there's a very good reason for that. Now, I am going to... There, there are other reviewers who point out that it's really nice that the, you know, that it is so positive of a depiction of BDSM. Stories of forbidden love have always been popular with filmmakers, but it's rare for any film to take on the challenge of depicting a love which a sizable portion proportion of its audience might also wish to forbid. Secretary is just that. It has all the elements of a traditional movie romance. They meet, they become attracted to each other, he can't come to terms with his feelings, she encounters a rival for her affections, etc. But it's built around, around a relationship whose foundation is physical pain. Saying that work is painful takes on a whole new meaning in Secretary. I never in a million years would have thought that the day would come when what is essentially a non-judgmental romantic comedy about two people practicing sadomasochistic love would be hailed as anything but sick. Indeed, Secretary was hailed as a bit of a coming out party for actress. Maggie Gyllenhaal, who after this performance can pretty much punch her own ticket. Lee's father is an alcoholic, and her mother and father spend more time fighting than anything else. Though it's being marketed as an s and comedy, which it is, make no mistake about that, Secretary turns out to be, at its core, a romance film every bit as sappy as a Meg Ryan movie. Yeah, yeah. I can understand why some people might want a more... a 
a different way of take that and maybe it's been made since this movie and I just haven't watched it if not I hope it does someday get made I'd, I'd like to watch that as well but I I, f I feel like this is you know this this maybe isn't the whole it's not the whole thing but it's the first step on the way you know and I yeah I, I am glad that because the thing is, a lot of people can sit down and watch this, even though they usually don't get into, you know, e even if the, the, even if S&M is something that they usually can't wrap their head around, I, did, I don't mean that as an insult, if, if it's something they, they don't really understand or approve of then yeah making a Meg Ryan movie or a Julia Roberts movie but where it's about the the it's about BDSM I I feel like that's the the you know for, for some people it is going to be you know the the It's, that's something that communicates it really well. Because for a lot of people, they cannot get past... Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess... I guess basically it's the idea that how can you intentionally cause physical pain for a person you love? Or how can you want for a person you love to intentionally cause physical pain for you and if you know yeah for for that you know for people who really just who who don't understand it yet if they watch this movie you know they could see oh you know it's just it's another thing you know i mean the the yeah i i do want other you know, other positive depictions of BDSM relationships, but where it is more, uh, less conventional, I guess, is the, yeah. And, let's see. All right, the, the short story is called Bad Behavior, which is also a great title for this kind of thing. Excuse me. Hmm. Yeah, that is everything. Wow, it feels so weird to, to make such, to spend so little time of the day recording, but then there was no episode of a Marvel Studios show this week, and I'm really, really looking forward to next week. But apparently there's going to be like a week with, or yeah, there's going to be an empty week between some of these shows, that's that's going to continue to be, be really, really difficult for me. You know, I'm still still recovering from, from WandaVision having ended, if not. I love the ending. It's not that, but it's the fact that there's going to be no more WandaVision. That's, that really hurts. But yeah, that is everything that I had written down prepared. So I guess, yeah, I'm just really briefly going to show, actually, now nah, I mean, yeah, you can, you can look it up online. Like I said, it's a, it's not a very good way to advertise the movie. No, no, I'm not going to show the cover. I, I was going to, but it's, yeah, I have 
nothing further to add. So I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.